Hi, I'm Rob Cousin. Welcome to my shop. We're continuing our series on dovetails by hand, layout tips and tricks. This will help you not only have it fit nice, but look fantastic. That's the best part. Stay with us. I'm going to show you everything you need to know. I'm Rob Cosman and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new to our channel, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell, which will alert you whenever we release a new video. Anytime we use a new tool or technique, we'll leave a description down below so that make it easier for you to find. All right, let's get back to work. I've been teaching folks to cut dovetails. I think I taught my first class way back in 1987, so it's been over 30 years. And in that time, I have evolved. Um, how it looks is very subjective. And what I'm gonna offer for you is what I think looks good and why, things that you can consider. But when I teach new people to do it, they're so excited just getting the two pieces to fit that they don't take the time to stand back and look at it and say, well, but proportionally does it look right? That's what I wanna focus on. I'm also gonna share with you some information on tools, what I think is gonna be best to use. And I'm gonna tell you about the method that I, I use, which was taught to me by Alan Peters, which I've never found anything that could even come close. Extremely precise and easy to do. Takes a little bit of brain math at first, but once it, the lights come on, it's easy, and then you can adapt it to any joint that you're gonna work with. So we'll go through this one story right after another, and by the time we're done, I think you'll actually be better at laying out your dovetails and it'll show in your work. Stay with us. All right, first thing I wanna cover are the tools. Now, here's what I would consider to be layout tools for dovetails. And although I'm not gonna use it today necessarily, but it still has to be talked about. Marking gauge, dovetail marking knife. This one has a sawtooth blade. And more specific to what we're walk working with today, a red pen, dovetail marker, and a pair of dividers. Now, you can always opt for a sliding T-bevel, but there is the inconvenience of having to set it every time that you do it, whereas that's already fixed. And it doesn't really matter what size dividers you're using. But these are the tools. The marking gauge is what makes your baseline, so it has to be precise. And I'm surprised at how many people will pass this off. This creates part of the finished joint. If that line is not crisp, then when you put the joint together, it's not going to produce what looks like a nice tight joint. Even though it may be tight, if that line's not crisp, you got a round edge coming together against another edge and it produces a gap. So you want that gauge mar that marking gauge cutter to be flat on the face side and razor sharp. This gets used in the transfer of tails to pins, so cover that in another video. But these are the tools that I use for the actual layout. It's really simple, not hard. Next thing I'm going to do is actually talk to you about using the dividers and the Allen Peters method. Divide, as far as dividers go, I like the ones that stay put. There are friction fit ones and they're just too easy to move them accidentally. These ones stay where you set them and it's nice if they have that speed nut on there which allows you to make a macro adjustment really quickly and then just come in tight and then do your final little bit. But before we even start that, let's talk about the actual proportions. I like to see, we call these half pins. These are on the outside and these are the interior pins. Now that doesn't matter whether you're talking about through dovetails like this or whether you're talking about half blinds. I always like to have the outside half pins bigger than the interior pins. There's nothing supporting that side of it, so it's all by itself. That way, I, I want it to, I try to get it to project the uh, impression of strength without being overbearing. And if you make these a little bit too big, they automatically go from looking right to looking out of balance. And that's a tough one to master. I tell people, I said, that's something you just have to practice, keep all your practice pieces, date them, and just kind of look back over time and see how, you, how you're doing and how you like it. I typically are somewhere around a quarter of an inch, pardon me, at this point, because it's all done through the layout of the tail. So up here, I'm usually a little bit one side or the other of a quarter of an inch. All right, let's actually show you on here. Like I said, this, is taught, this was taught to me by Alan Peters, and if you notice, anytime you see my dovetails, they're always symmetrical. I don't do the uh, big ones on the inside, little ones on the outside. I like them perfectly symmetrical. That's just the way I am. So that's what I'm gonna teach you. 
I'm talk I'm got a piece of wood in front of me that measures I think three and three quarters three and just a little over three and a half three and nine sixteenths so the first thing I would do looking at that based on its thickness and I think that's five eighths might be a little bit bigger it is it's 11 sixteenths wide so I would look at that and have to come up with how big do those outside half pins need to be now I don't measure it but for your reference like I said I'm usually somewhere around a quarter of an inch so I would just kind of stand there and look at it and think eh, that's too big that's definitely too small it would look frail so I'm gonna say maybe something just right about there and again a lot of this comes from having done it numerous times but I'm gonna try to verbalize that for you so that you can kind of uh, figure out my thought pattern and then adapt it to your own so I get it where I think it's close what I'm gonna do is laying resting one leg of the divider on the outside edge I'm gonna make a little mark in the wood now you don't want these to be too deep if you make them too deep when it comes time to planing flushing up the joint you're gonna find these holes and you're gonna have to take off a lot more material to get rid of them so don't have a heavy hand there do the same thing on both sides now I set that pair of dividers aside why well most things I make are gonna have four corners and if I have two dividers I can go to the next corner and that's already preset as will this one when I'm ready to use it I don't normally do this at this time but for the sake of making it easier to follow along I'm gonna do it this time I use a red pen and people ask why do you use a red pen well because a red pen is easier to see in dark wood the line width does not change and of course it's always sharp the nice thing about this technique is you can put your pen in that little hole that the divider made you can allows you to come with your dovetail marker until it registers now the nice thing about the dovetail marker as opposed to using a square and a sliding t-bevel it's one tool and it's one setting to do two things square uh, square my line across the end and draw my angled mark up the face now you'll notice I came up instead of going down why well I find it a lot easier to start at the baseline and come up than it is to go from here and try to stop at the baseline why do I worry about going past the baseline you're training yourself with the saw to follow the line and if you're not always paying 100% attention you may end up sawing below the line below the gauge line because you were following that pen mark so why not stop the line where you want your saw cut to stop all right this gauge allows for a one in six slope or one in seven now that needs to be explained one in six simply means the angle that you would achieve by coming over one inch and going down six inches that angle whoops that wasn't very good See if we can do a little better. No, that pen doesn't work on that stuff. A one and seven angle would be over one inch, down seven. Not as much slope. The one and six translates to about 10 degrees, and the one and seven is about eight. Typically, on soft woods or woods that readily compress, you want to have more leverage, so you increase the splay or the angle on your dovetail. On hardwoods that don't compress as readily, you can back that off. I used to use one in seven on all of my hardwoods, but I use one in six now on just about everything. And the reason is, from across the room, a one in six, you can actually still see the slope. Whereas one in seven from about seven or eight feet away, it starts to look like maybe just a bad box joint. I like one in six, you can do whatever you want, but I would caution you to avoid getting too extreme. If you come down in here and start going one in four, then this grain up here is very short grain and it makes it very fragile. So there's a balance that has to be achieved. You need them some slope for the leverage or for the wedging action of the joint, but you also need to protect those corners from breaking off during assembly. So I never go any low, I typically never go any lower than one and six. And I never, certainly would never go higher than one and seven because you're so upright. Like I said, you can't even see the slope. So the line across the end must be square with no exceptions this is the make or break of the joint that has got to be a square line we've got our one and six slope now in order to do that side with this same marker the reason why it's shaped like a T I spin it like this put my pen in the hole move the gauge over to it saves for those of us with eyesight failing make sure you have a good 
easy to see line, find your gauge mark and come up. So now we have the two outside half pins. That leaves us to determine how many tails are we going to put in here. So now our next question is, how many tails do we put in a board that measures three and nine sixteenths? And the first question would be, well, why not just one big tail? Well, the problem is one big tail only gives you a limited amount of strength because the dovetail actually gets its strength from the interaction of the gluing surface between long grain and long grain. Anytime long grain touches end grain, it doesn't count. Now you would think that the strength actually comes from the shape of the dovetail, and that's true to a certain measure, but the actual strength comes from gluing long grain to long grain that we know results in a joint that is stronger than the wood itself. But I will say this, you always want to make sure that you place the tails, this is the tails, I refer to this as the tail board, to counteract the greatest resistance. Here's what I mean. If I was building a hanging wall cabinet, I would always put the tails on the side because this is constantly fighting gravity. When it comes to a drawer, you always want to have the tails on the drawer side. Why? Well, <clears throat> when you open the drawer, you're pulling the drawer front away from the drawer sides. So that force is acting here. And on the back, typically the contents slam against the back, trying to knock the back off. So again, the dovetail shape or the wedge works against that force. There's very little, if any, force going in this direction. So that's hardly even an issue. And certainly the glue would be more than what you need there. So do we go with one big tail? No, nope, just not enough strengths. Do we go with two, divide this in half? Well, it would double our gluing surface, but on something that wide, I would say it almost looks like somebody was lazy. Not quite enough. You want it to be interesting to look at. You don't want it to be too busy. And I'm gonna talk about that when we go beyond the, med the number of tails I actually am going to choose. But two, not quite enough. I suppose you could get away with it if it was something piece of shop furniture or something but for a piece of furniture I'm going to have in my home I want to have a little more interesting stuff going on than just two tails so I would actually go in and do three and three is going to give me a nice balance between the pins number of pins and tails the overall size and shape of each of them and I'm going to lay it out and then I'll show it to you and then we'll talk about what if we took it a little bit further so that set pair of dividers gets set aside because that represents my half pin that I can use when I go to the next corner. So now I'm gonna come in here, and there's a couple of ways of doing this, and this, is, this was taught to me by Alan Peters. I fell in love with it because everything is perfectly symmetrical. It's sometimes easier to teach this way so that you can follow along. But what I'm dealing with is the surface area between this half pin and this half pin. The first thing I want to do is divide it into three separate or three equal pieces. So just guessing at it, open my dividers up, careful not to leave marks, starting on the half pin, step one, two, three times. Well now I got lucky because that divided into, th well actually it wasn't perfect so let's open up just a little bit. And by the way, Anytime you're making adjustments on the dividers as it pertains to laying out the tails, anything you do here in terms of adjusting gets multiplied by the number of times you step. So if I was doing a 24 inch wide case and I was making adjustments, a small adjustment on the divider is going to end up in a, being a big adjustment by the time you step off to the end. So I just did a very small amount. Let's do this again, starting right on the half pin. I actually set the divider right in the original divider hole. Step, step, there. All right, that gives me three equal spaces, which is fine for dividing the space up by three, but what about a pin? Well, in order to get that, I'm gonna open the dividers up a little bit more. Remember, any amount we open up gets multiplied by the number of times we step. So I'm gonna open it up just a little bit and this time I'm gonna start in the same spot on the half pin. I'm gonna step, step. Now you're gonna notice that this leg is gonna go beyond that line. And the amount that it goes beyond will determine how big these inside pins are. 
And I'm gonna want, I want them to be a little bit bigger than that. So I'm gonna open the dividers up a little bit more. Starting on the half pin, always. Step, remember, be very careful not to leave a bunch of marks out here. Now that's gonna give me an interior pin that's a little better than a 16th. And for this particular joint, I like that. I'm gonna go with it. So what I'm gonna do is start over on the half pin, leave a mark, leave a mark. Now when I get here, I take the dividers out, I put them on that half pin mark, and I go back, leaving a mark, leaving a mark. Now I have two little marks at representing the outside edges of the, each pin. So I would come in here with my dividers, come to the, using a one and six, come to the first mark, put the pen in the hole, move the gauge over to it. Make sure I get a perfectly square line and come up the face. Skip the next one, go to the next, do the same thing, pen in the hole, move the gauge over to it, come up the face. Now I'm gonna spin it around so I can use that same one and six, because remember, the dovetail marker allows for one and seven or one and six, so you have to pay attention to that. Pen in the hole, move the gauge over, come up the face, and final one, pen in the hole, up the face. Now before I do anything else, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna put some hash marks. And these hash marks are going to represent which side, I don't know why that pen doesn't wanna work there, which side of that line I'm going to saw on. Try to be neat about this. And I'll do it everywhere in terms of the waist with the exception of back here. Completely redundant to mark on three sides. When I'm sawing, I can see here and here, I can't see here. If your saw is any good, whatever you do here and here will be done over here as well. So no reason to mark the back sides, only confusing. This way I always know which is my face side because that's the side I mark on. Okay, I've identified all my waste. Now, why not go four pin tails? You could. That would be the outer limit, I would suggest. And there's a couple of reasons for it. Number one, it's gonna to look too busy. But number two, you have to take this into account. There are times when you have to think about the strength of the joint. We have a piece of pine that is, what did we say, three and nine sixteenths of an inch wide. Now, let me just come back in here. The pen didn't leave a very distinct mark on this. Okay, we have across here three and nine sixteenths, which if you tried to break that, it's pretty strong. By the time we've cut this all out, we are right on this baseline, we are going to lose, what is that, about three eighths of an inch? Yeah, let's call them all three eighths of an inch. So four three eighths, is going to be an inch and a half. So we've effectively retaken an inch and a half of material off of this. So take three and nine sixteenths, remove an inch and a half, you're down to two and a sixteenth. So we have taken this three and, three and nine sixteenths inch piece of pine and we created a weak point right here at the base of the tails that is only the strength of two and a sixteenth of an inch. Every time you put in another pin you're going to reduce that even further until you eventually get to a point where you're, you create an extremely weak link right here and there's a good chance the joint's going to break if stressed along that baseline. Well, you don't want to do that. Yes, you're increasing the strength of the actual joint because you're increasing the glue surface, but you're decreasing the strength because you've weakened it right along there. So for two reasons. One, it looks too busy. Two, you risk weakening the joint. Now some people say, well, what about these little tiny pins? Well, let me explain that. Most of the dovetails that you're going to cut, you're going to find in drawers. I would say that 90% of all dovetails anybody cuts end up in drawers. I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of where I vary from that. Here's a piece of furniture that we're working on. I shall take this one out, it's a little bit easier. And you'll see that the pins are actually quite small. However, 
Typically, in drawer construction, the drawer front is going to be thicker than the drawer side. So that means, even though that pin gets very small right there, there's a fair bit of material when you add it all up. This drawer side is purposely fairly thin, and the reason is it keeps the drawer nice and light. So, but I have a lot more of the tail wood than I do of the pin wood. However, because of the thickness of the pin wood, it balances out nicely, and if that joint were to fail, first of all, it would be the uh, wood that would fail, not the actual glue joint. But this is going to survive any stress put upon normal course of uh, force that a drawer would be subjected to. There is an exception to that. I built this as my traveling tool case. So when I did it, I realized it's gonna be under a lot of force. The two pieces of wood are the same thickness, top and bottom. So I, did, I balanced the size of my tails to pins a little bit more. However, this piece wasn't gonna be stressed nearly as much as this piece. This was the outer cabinet. And I actually made the tails and pins the same, even though they're made out of plywood. I made the tails and the pins the same width for the very reason that I wanted maximum strength on both. This time it matters, this one not nearly as much. All right, from here we're gonna go on and talk a little more about the overall look of the joint. I have samples of dovetails that I've cut as far back as 1988. And there's probably 30 times more than what you see. But I want to go through and just show you some of the samples and kind of show you how this has evolved. I think the oldest example I have is right here. Uh, yes, this one. Now this is where they were actually made proud, but just kind of get a look at the size. And then this would be probably a year or so later. Pins are about the same size. This was in the late 90s. And I started going to really small pins. These are just the width of the actual dovetail saw. And I don't do that anymore. Look back now and really don't like it. Had nothing to do with strength, just eh. This would have been in the uh, 2003, 4, 5 era. Half blinds, mind you. This one dates 2013. Now, here's what I've done lately, and this is what I tend to settle on, what I like. And it's funny because I did a, a video with Alan Peters back in 2005. And at the time, I was cutting the pins just the width of the saw blade. And he didn't like it. And uh, now I come to uh, realize what he was getting at. And I, I like this. I like a little bit of width. I always try to tell, I always tell folks, if you're going to cut them by hand, then at least cut your pins smaller than what a router can do. I mean, if you're going to do them the same as a router, then use a router. So they're always going to be less than 3 sixteenths of an inch. But that just has a, uh, a nice balance between strengths and the finesse that you get with the smaller pins. So I like that. All right, final step in this. And this really doesn't pertain to layout as much, but it's critical that you pay attention to this during your layout. So that's why I want to explain it. And it's all about how important it is that you cut, or pardon me, you draw and cut across the end of the tailboard perfectly perpendicular. A lot of folks sometimes are a little bit sloppy when they're laying these out. Well, if these lines are not perpendicular, how can you possibly make a saw cut? But I want to show you why it's so important. And I'm going to purposely do it incorrectly. So if I didn't follow my line like I should, and I made this cut, and even if the other one was perfect, I'm going to remove that waste. Now, here's what happens. If this is the face side, you set this on top of your pin board. And what you're going to do with a knife or with a sawtooth blade, if I grab a sample, even though it's a piece of MDF, you're going to trace 
what ends up being the top of the pin from the bottom of the tail. In other words, down in here, that's where you're going to get your mark. That means that this size must be absolutely the same as this size. If it isn't, if this ends up being smaller, when you put the joint together and this pin comes up into this opening, it's going to be loose, there's going to be a gap. If you've cut it in such a way that you actually sloped out like this, and this, surf this area was larger than this area, now that pin that you've li laid out from the bottom of the tail is going to be larger than the opening up here where it eventually seats after you put it together and something is going to split. So this opening and this opening must be the same size. That only happens if this cut and this cut are perpendicular and parallel to one another. That is the critical part. When I teach dovetails, if you get that wrong, start over. Cut the joint off and start over. You can't fix it. Now, what I need you to do is tell me what part of the dovetailing process has you dumbfounded, and maybe I can help. If you enjoy my method of work and like my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos to help take your woodworking to the next level. Now, I've always said, better tools make the job so much easier. If you click on the icon with the plane and the chisel, it'll take you to our website, introduce you to all of our tools that we actually manufacture right here, as well as our workshops, both in person and online. Good luck.